Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming out on such a miserable night. Sure, will bring some joy to you when you see some of the work that's on show tonight. Um, and welcome to the University of Melbourne, um, incorporating the Melbourne School of Design. In our evening keynote lecture by Rashapon Shukriai, my name is Alan Pert and I'm Deputy Dean here at the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning. And firstly, I'd like to acknowledge they were coming together tonight on the unceded land of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Eastern Kulin Nation, who have been the custodians of the lands for thousands of years. The university acknowledges and is grateful to the traditional owners, elders and knowledge holders of all Indigenous nations and clans who have been instrumental in our reconciliation journey. We recognise the unique place held by our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the original owners and custodians of the lands and waterways across the Australian continent, with histories of continuous connection dating back more than 60,000 years. We also acknowledge their enduring cultural practices of caring for country. We pay respect to elders past and present and future and acknowledge the importance of Indigenous knowledge in the academy. And as a community of researchers, of teachers, of students and professional staff, we are privileged to work and to learn every day with Indigenous colleges, uh, colleagues and partners. Now, the Melbourne School of Design has had a partnership with M Pavilion since its inception, having collaborated in several seminars, various talks, workshops and exhibitions that celebrate architecture and design excellence in the city's built form. Two weeks ago, we also celebrated the relocation of the 2019 Pavilion by Pritzker Prize winner, Glenn Murkett, which now rests lightly on University Square. And we look forward to bringing this wonderful structure back to life in 2023 through a partnership with the University's Cultural Commons and the School of Design. Now I want to take this opportunity to thank Naomi Milgram and the Foundation for their continued support and for another significant contribution, this time to our campus, which will help to reinforce our estate as an important part of the cultural landscape of our city. Now, before I go into um, inviting our keynote speaker to the stage, I'd like to invite Sam Redston from the Foundation to say a few words. Thank you, Alan, uh, and good evening. We're delighted to be back at the Melbourne School of Design. I'm Sam, I'm the CEO of the Naomi Milgram Foundation, the creators of the M Pavilion. And we also acknowledge the traditional custodians, the unceded land upon which we meet, work and create, the people of the Eastern Kulin Nations, and we pay our respects to their elders, past and present, their cultural leaders, and those First Nations people who will be with us today or perhaps watching the live stream. We're in the final stages of preparation for the opening of the ninth M Pavilion, an incredible, joyous, innovative design created by Thai architect Rachapon Tachui of All Zone. Over the coming three weeks, construction will be completed, the grass will be laid, the lighting will be tested, and the season shall commence on the 8th of December. We'll see more than 2,000 people come together to create more than 300 free design events, a unique program generating new ideas, relationships, and initiatives that continue beyond the M Pavilion. So I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank our visionary partners who joined with the Naomi Milgram Foundation to make this all happen. The Victorian Government through Creative Victoria and the City of Melbourne, with further support by many cultural, education, and philanthropic partners including a special connection this year with the Royal Thai Embassy, the Royal Thai Consulate and the Thai Australian Chamber. So on behalf of all who participate and engage with our program, I thank them. And every pavilion has captured the world's imagination and demonstrated Victoria's capacity to lead an international design conversation about contemporary architecture, creating new, ambitious, experimental architecture to inspire and provoke is a result of a close collaboration with our construction and design team who work passionately to realise the design. Scavello Constructions, our builder and fabricator of the complex steel elements, ACOM, who provide fire structure, structural and fire engineering advice, Tensus, engineers specialising in lightweight tension structures, Gardner Group, our building surveyors, Serge Ferrari, who donated the unique technical fabrics you will see in the layered roof, and Dulux, who provided technical advice, paint finishes, and shall go on to transform our kiosk structure throughout the summer. 
Each are playing a vital role to create the M Pavilion 2022. So I thank them. And I'm now very happy to hand back to Alan to introduce Bashpon. Thanks, Sam. Well, now for our star guest tonight. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Rasha Portachui, co-founder and design director um, of Allzone. They're the architects for this year's 2022 M Pavilion. Now, each and every year, the design community awaits with great anticipation on the announcement of the next M Pavilion architect. And it was overwhelming delight, I think, when the ninth in the series was unveiled online as a bright, bold and joyful structure with layers of bespoke fire-coloured nets and architectural fabrics by Allzone, who, as Sam said, are based in Bangkok in Thailand. Now, M Pavilion 2022 isn't Allzone's first foray into temporary architecture. The studio has made a name for itself by designing playful platforms for people to gather, and Rasha Por is constantly exploring how architects can build the lightest building, not just in terms of materials, in terms of structure or energy consumption, but also in terms of environmental and social conditions. For M Pavilion, Rasha Porn and the team at Allzone have drawn inspiration from their Marmadale Sky, which was a temporary pavilion designed back in 2017 as part of the Wonderfruit Festival. For Rasha Porn, architecture is always about people, and she views the spaces they are creating not just as physical architecture, but as platforms for people to convene, to converse, and to converge and celebrate. And aligning perfectly with the idea of M Pavilion as an important public stage for established and emerging artists, designers, performers, architects, writers, and critics to come together with the general public. Ozone's work focuses on the exploration of architecture in a time of rapid transformation through research and design practice. Part of this fascination is driven by climatic concerns, and in 2016, for example, they completed the first contemporary art museum in Thailand and then participated in the 2019 Charza Architecture Trinale with both projects, great examples of the studio's deft and ongoing study of sustainability and adaptive reuse. Another example is Pau Wau Wau, an eco-conscious lifestyle community in Bangkok's Sukhumvit district, and their international collaborations and exhibitions include those at the Guggenheim Museum, the Chicago Architecture Biennale in 2015, the Vitra Design Museum in 2017, the Trinale de Milano in 2018, as well as the Ishigo Sumori Trinale in 2018. Domus Magazine also selected Allzone as one of the 100 best architecture firms in 2019. Now, Rasha Porn is the Louis Kahn Visiting Assistant Professor at Yale. She received a Master of Science degree in Advanced Architectural Design from Columbia University and a PhD in Architectural History from the University of Tokyo. She was a faculty member at the Faculty of Architecture, Chulong Kong University, for 10 years between 2002 and 2022, sorry, 20 years. <laughs> and it was in 2009 that she co-founded Allzone in Bangkok, where she is currently the design director. So please settle in, everyone, for what I'm sure is going to be an inspiring, wide-ranging discussion about um, this year's M Pavilion, but also the diversity of projects from the practice. Please welcome Rasha Porn. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Alan. It's uh, very long and very precise. I am very honored to be back here again in Melbourne, uh, sharing what uh, we have done and what we are doing uh, since uh, 2019 when I participate in uh, Living City Forums. And um, thank you very much, uh, Melbourne School of Design, for having me here and also uh, Naomi Milgram Foundation, especially Naomi herself, who giving uh, this great opportunity for us, Ozone, to work on the M Pavilion this year. Um, the overall has been a uh, really incredible journey, uh, working with so many talented individuals here in Melbourne. The M Pavilion team are great, uh, they're all great. Um, ACOM, Tencent, uh, Leanne Silke, and a lot of other um, people who have been uh, collaborating uh, with us 
on the project, and uh, I hope you could see all these uh, efforts in our pavilion in three weeks. Um, today, I would like to share with you uh, about the M Pavilion as an important step of uh, the ideas of architecture. We have we have been working for some years uh, in also in the context of our previous work. Um, actually, it was difficult for me because I just gave a lecture in Melbourne some three years ago, so I had to try to find a way not to repeat myself. <laughs> so I was checking all the slides not to duplicate any of them, but this one is kind of necessary. Since I'm speaking in a school today, I would like to go back uh, with my education a little bit. I studied architecture in university. And after that, I worked with a big firm in Bangkok. And I didn't like it at all, so I decided that I'm not going to become an architect. But uh, I like architecture very much, so I continued to study architecture until my PhD, thinking that I'm not going to become an architect. But I will do everything around architecture, teaching, writing, whatever, doing everything, but not designing. So after I finished my PhD, I came back to Bangkok and I started teaching and uh, receiving small commissions to design um, exhibitions and all, all installations. That was quite fun because it's quick and uh, you can get the result right away. And I could actually experiment with a lot of also materials because uh, with exhibition, you, you don't have much of the regulations. But then I had to transform the building uh, for myself to leave. Uh, that's I discussed a lot uh, in the Living City Forum. So that was my first job as an architect. But I'm, I'm going to skip that so that if you want to know more, you can check the video. I think it's still there. <laughs> um, but then I want to talk about this because this actually gave me really an opportunity to think about architecture. When I did the um, transformation of this uh, building, uh, as you could imagine, we have to, we have to tear down things. And uh, mountains and mountains of debris and garbage came out from this very small building that I teared down wall. Only walls, actually. But you still have like mountains of garbage. And I was quite terrified by that fact that uh, we create such a huge amount of waste, uh, construction waste. And um, I started to think uh, if we can build lighter with less materials, how could we reduce it until it become minimum, not minimal, but minimum? Like, w w where, is the, where is the borderline? How far can we go? How far can we reduce? And also, it uh, with our conditions now, everything changing so fast, uh, how could we make a building that it is more adaptive to the conditions? Like we've been through a um, few years of the pandemic. We know that uh, if we want to change the way we divide the room in a house, it's really difficult, right? But sometimes we cannot really live in the same room because someone uh, in our family, uh, got COVID and all that. So uh, the conditions of living is really changing a lot, but architecture is actually very rigid. That's what I'm, I'm kind of having in mind all the time. And the first commission I got as an architect, like not working for myself, it's to, to design a market, really, uh, like open air market in the suburb of Bangkok. And um, it's actually a very minimum form of architecture. It's a market, it's not, nothing fancy. Uh, it has to be very uh, utilitarian, but at the same time, the space should be nice, and uh, we organize the space how people can uh, put their uh, food stall, and also uh, in terms of lights and ventilation. So it's very simple project, very uh, light structure in a way. So we kind of learned a lot uh, from that as well, how actually 
uh, locals, like really ordinary people, they organize the space in a very uh, smart way with very minimum materials that they have. So that was quite a good experience and uh, give actually it gave us even more obsession to look into architecture that could give us uh, a lighter forms uh, of building. And uh, fast forward to 10 years uh, after, just a few years ago, we had a chance to apply the same ideas again, but with a smaller project, a little bit more like upscale, uh, the client got to rent this small lot in the middle of a very dense area of Bangkok for 10 years. And they want to build uh, a small retail space. But it has to be cheap because it will last only for 10 years because they get, they get to rent this place only for 10 years. So we, we um, offer them this idea that we build like a big roof and then uh, we can have uh, small boxes under the roof so that uh, the uh, air conditioning system will be very little. That is a very expensive part of building. And we ha can focus on how to make uh, the structure uh, that could stand for 10 years. But, and then uh, the elements that are not necessary are too much, we can try to cut it off. So, uh, and the main space will be like under the roof. Uh, people can enjoy the space purely uh, just under the shades. We get some natural lights uh, from the roof, but then we diffuse it also with uh, some uh, small, very thin uh, metal mesh to have the light more uniform. And um, the project actually started before COVID but it's finished right, right in the middle of the peak of COVID at the end of 2020. Uh, it, with difficulty, of course, during COVID, the construction was very complex. Uh, but then when it's finished, it's, uh, it's really became popular during that time because uh, it is a kind of outdoor space that people want to come and enjoy. And, uh, I thought it makes sense. Uh, actually, the climatic condition in a place like Bangkok, if you have enough uh, shade, enough roof, uh, with uh, some insulation, with good ventilation, you don't really need to be in a conditioning uh, area. It's, it's uh, pleasant enough. So the project also got uh, a Monaco Design Award 2021. To, just like out of the blue. We didn't apply or anything. Just one day they called and said, okay, we give you an award. So that was good. <laughs> um, so the, I'm, I'm gonna show you the series of like the, our obsession working with the, like small shades and light roof uh, in a few of the project before we arrive to the end pavilion. Uh, this one is, uh, is a project um, that we did for Bangkok Design Week uh, a few years ago as well. It is a small street, actually full of uh, street vendors, and they want to make it a little bit special uh, to give a shade to the street because during the, the day it, it was very hot and people would use this as uh, uh, the lunch area. But then during the, the festival, Bangkok Design Week, they want to, to make it a bit more special. So we, we just built a very light roof structure. Uh, again, very low budget uh, with the steel structure as, uh, as uh, a lot of column. And then we used, uh, we, we were impressed by this technique, uh, this uh, orange, yeah, let me see if I can point out. This, this one is the local decoration technique in, in Thailand. I think it's many places they have this. They just use a piece of clothes and uh, uh, some pin to drape 
to make pleats and drape around an object, like whatever object, whatever form they can, they can wrap it. And I was impressed. But after they finish, they just take off all this pin, and you get the same fabric. Wow, impressive. So we, we try to uh, imitate that idea, uh, uh, making some experiment with few uh, materials. But we didn't use the pin. We used uh, the cable tie. We just tie them in. And then if it, we want to uh, have the fabric back into the same shape, we just cut the cable tie. And uh, because the, the street we work on, they have like different stalls, so we have to have it uh, big and small, depends on where, where the roof goes. So uh, this uh, technique allows us to have the one piece of clothes, but adaptive to different area. So this is how it is. So during, during the day, it gives quite a shade. And, uh, it's uh, people don't even really notice that there's a shade, but they feel like something strange going on here because, because um, you get this shade on the, on the ground, but then the, the roof is almost disappearing. So this is how uh, it, it was. To, and they, it lasts for uh, around six months. After the week of uh, Bangkok Design Week, they, they said, ah, it's nice. We can, we can keep it on for a while. So that, uh, it lasts for about six months, finally. And then we uh, work on this another project. It's uh, a temporary roof installation uh, in the wood, also for Wonder Fruit uh, Music Festival. Uh, near Bangkok, they have this big music festival at the end of the year, and then this is a place where they have party at night. Um, the the idea of this festival is uh, creative, sustainable. So everything has to be zero waste, leave no trace. It has to be light, and then it has to be reused. Uh, everything should be reused or recycled. So we came up with. Uh, this idea that uh, we make a small unit of something that uh, it's in between objects and uh, it, in between objects and rooms. So it's come out to like a uh, small animal working together because they, uh, the, each unit can, can be full and it can enlarge and uh, reduce. So it could adapt with uh, very uh, various uh, topography in this area quite well. And the material is from recycled uh, plastic uh, uh, woven into, into pieces. So that's how it works, like the structure. And then because of this uh, um, flexibility, you can actually adapt it with uh, a lot of different topography in, in the area. So this is uh, during the day that you have like look like uh, birds flying in, in the space. And then during the night, we put uh, this uh, fluorescent tape. When they have uh, the um, concert lighting, it looks like a lot of butterflies flying into the space. We call this project uh, butterfly effects. So this is like different lights. And with the same uh, festival, Wonder Fruit in different years, as Alan just mentioned, we did another uh, temporary installations uh, called, we call it Marmalade Sky. Uh, the idea is to create a big shades, uh, just shapes uh, in, in the space. And um, we experiment with different fabric and we found that uh, the waffle structure is very interesting because it allows the light to go through, but uh, it also creates shades. And you can actually look through into the sky. So uh, that's how we, we, we fall out. And, uh, and then we try with different versions. And uh, we finally come up with uh, units of 8 by 8 meter. And we just hang it very lightly with the uh, steel uh, structure, uh, like here. So it's very simple. And then uh, this is how we install, just with some cable. And uh, we just hang it up. And, uh, and they take the shape as, as, as the force of the, the, the weight uh, would take. And uh, since it's very light, 
and transparent. It's uh, quite uh, dissolved into the environment. And it always look like rendering. People always ask, but this is a real project or the rendering? But it is real. I mean, I'm, I'm not able to do this rendering. <laughs> it would take too much of the computer capacity. So this is all real. And, um, and then during, uh, when, it's, uh, when it's windy, you have like movement and so on. But then it is a uh, very simple structure. You cannot, uh, if it's raining, okay, it's finished. <laughs> so this is during uh, one of the event people just lay down, uh, having good time. And uh, the, the idea is that this structure can be uh, set up anywhere so right after that we got a request from i wouldn't believe even now the office of prime minister in bangkok to set up this in front of the office during uh children day so that uh, children would uh, think that this is not a scary place which actually it is a scary place <laughs> <laughs> they, they just want want to alert children to go in by this hour installation and it was quite uh, actually useful. So this is the, in front of the, uh, the, uh, the building. And uh, this project is, uh, was uh, another development from that, uh, but with different uh, um, context. At the Living City Forum in 2019, I met Adrian LaHood, who was uh, also the, um, in the panels uh, of that year, Adrian was the chief curator of the first Charter Architecture Triennial. And a few months after that, he invited us to work on uh, a project in Charter, given a task that we have to make some small interventions uh, that benefit the city, like make something that uh, the city would think that it is useful. And uh, I, was, uh, I, was, I was completely blank. I had no idea. I never been to, I've been like connecting flights in the UAE many times, but I never been really into uh, Dubai or in Sharjah. So uh, I said, okay, I had to go because uh, I couldn't work remotely without knowing the context. It was really a kind of suicidal decision because it was August. It was completely insane. It was so hot. Like the temperature outside was like 45 to 48 degrees Celsius. And then when you get inside in the building, it's like 18. <laughs> so the, the difference of the temperature between inside and outside was really crazy. It just, that's why nobody was outside at all. Only us walking on the street like crazy, stupid tourists. <laughs> like, and uh, when you got inside, it's like a blade uh, hit your, your back because it was so cold. We understood that uh, they actually put air conditioning everywhere and people don't really go out from the air conditioning place at all. Even because I think because the electricity is also very, uh, very cheap. I, I assume they said that even when they go abroad, they don't turn on, they don't turn off air conditioning because it could be very uh, humid because the the temperature between inside and outside are too 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 much. So they they don't even turn turn off the air conditioning. So I found the idea was very crazy and, uh, and um, I propose that we should have a kind of transitional space between the interior and the exterior so that uh, you can move in and out uh, from the interior to the exterior uh, more comfortably uh, so that you don't need to be in, in the interior space all the time. So we just took one courtyard into the building of uh, Shah Jah Architecture Triennial, which was uh, an old primary school. And uh, we just proposed to put a fabric roof over. Uh, we 
We didn't really intend to use the same waffle structure, but then it just makes sense because uh, during the day we should shade the ground so that the ground is a bit cooler. And then during the night, uh, because the temperature of the, the sky, the air will be uh, very low, so we have to allow the heat to re release out to the, to the sky. So the perforated roof would make very sense. That's why we ended up using the, or again, the waffle structure, but with different angles of, uh, of the vertical, to, uh, the vertical line, so that it can shed completely the whole space. So this is, uh, we made some calculations, uh, very simple, uh, through very uh, basic SketchUp program, and then we get this pattern, and then, we, it came to the material. Um, we had very short time to actually to work on the whole project. It's like, actually it was like three months. And, uh, and then uh, the material available by then was this uh, agricultural uh, fabric. Very cheap, very simple. <laughs> and then we didn't even choose the color. These are the two colors that are available at that time. So we had to work with it. Just so let's make the best out of it. Again, uh, with the short time, nobody wanted to do it for us, so we had to, to do it ourselves. We bought a sewing machine, and <laughs> we learned how to use it. <laughs> now we are fine, we can do it. <laughs> we bought a sewing machine, like the industrial one, and we do it, uh, we made it at in-house, in, in the office. We did a lot of mock-up, like to see how it uh, works, and then we even make a kind of, this is the, already the end product, we did a, a set up, a kind of rehearsal, how to set up uh, at, the, at Sharjah, because we, didn't, we knew nothing about Sharjah, if uh, they're helpful, if a lot of people would help us. And, but then, the most difficult is to shift it to Sharjah. It's impossible, we didn't have time. So we had to carry it, then everything to Sharjah. We had to calculate everything, in terms of size, weight, to meet the, um, the allowance of the weight of six people. So <laughs> everything was like carry on, <laughs> not carry on, I mean, I mean put in the plane uh, with us to go to Sharjah and, uh, and then we install. And I'm very proud to say that we were the first one who finished the installation like four months before the opening while everyone else was still working very hard. And then uh, this is, this is you, how you see the difference between like the shades and the sun. It's really, the sun is really strong. And, uh, and this is the close-up. And this is uh, some of our miscalculations. Some of the light can still go through, but it became a nice pattern. And uh, even like after we, we, we installed for a few days and uh, if we haven't completed yet, people start to come to use it because it's the only shared place in the whole thing. So I was quite uh, rewarding right away. So this is how like all, all of them are the people working for the, the exhibitions. At, as I said, we didn't really choose the color. The color shows themselves with the building. Everyone thought that we chose the color to match the building, but actually it was not the case at all. It was the only availability. <laughs> so I, when I said that, people said, no, you are. <laughs> it's true, it's true. And um, compared to the M Pavilion that we are, I'm about to uh, show you, all the projects we've done so far were extremely simple in terms of technology, in terms of requirement, in terms of degree of experiments. Uh, and pavilion is really special because it's, you call it the pavilion, but it's actually even more complex than a building because um, people always ask me, what is the difference? What do you think are the difference uh, between this M Pavilion and other pavilions that we see around the world? I would say that uh, the programs that M Pavilion are running are enormous, like very complex, very, uh, very dense in this 
few months. So the pavilions, although it looks simple, it should accommodate really a lot of activities, like practical issues are here. So for us, it's really a big challenge to go from very simple pavilion that uh, people use it for a few days, weeks, or even just walk passing through to a place where a lot of activity will happen here. So uh, I, I'm, I'm going to get through a little bit. This is the, the first draft, the first idea that we present to the team uh, in October last year. Uh, we just got out from a peak of COVID. Like we just we just started to get back to to the office, and uh, so we we discussed a lot. We brainstorming, and uh, one thing we are certain is that we don't want to be in a room anymore. We don't want to be like in a room with walls confine us uh, in a small space. We want to go out into the world beyond. Uh, the wall. And not only that, we want to see a lot of people because we were kind of confined into small rooms and uh, we didn't really see many people. So um, the idea is that the pavilion should be um, the place to celebrate the outdoor life in public, meaning to see what other people are doing. And, uh, it should be a kind of uh, a structure that acts like a big tree is very friendly. Uh, you, when you see a tree, you really want to go under. That is uh, quite natural uh, because it gives you a shade, it gives you quite a uh, nice temperature and all that. So it should be like, uh, like big trees, uh, a group of big, big trees together uh, that uh, give you the idea that uh, it could be a nice place, light, soft, colorful, fun, and friendly. Of course, it has to be like without walls so that uh, we can see everything around us. So that's the, the idea, the very first idea. And then this is like the first sketches we have. The roof that uh, should be like very light and loose and soft and moving and then uh, uh, the space, the planning should be a different platform where uh, the platform can be a stage or a seat thing uh, or vice versa. It's, it, it should be like very flexible space. And um, okay, I forgot to say one thing is that when we start this idea, we want to have everything very loose, very relaxed without tension. It's like, how could we make a structure that without tension? We were wrong. We cannot. So, like, luckily we have Peter. We, Peter came in <laughs> and we cannot do that. Anyway, and um, we, we, we really want to push to the idea that uh, the, everything could be loose, could be moving and all that. And this is finally will be like the, the, the planning. I jump into the planning right away because it was like this from the beginning and then we didn't really change much. The planning will be like three, uh, two stage, two, two elevated platform, one kiosk, and uh, that they work together. Uh, uh, there could be seating, there could be stage and vice versa, and then the kiosk will be the place where they serve drinks and food serve. So, uh, and it also could be a background for, for the events. But then the difficulty is, uh, is on the roof. As I said, we really like to have everything loose, at loose, at light, as without tension as possible. And it has been a long discussion on this with ACOM and with Nigel from ACOM and Peter from uh, Tensis, how we can do this. I remember at some point, uh, Nigel said that uh, inside every one of us, there is a little structure engineer. When a building moves too much, we know that we have to run away. <laughs> so the idea is, okay, how we, how we gonna define that limit? How the building cannot move too much? What can we move? What cannot 
be moved, but have to be fixed. So we work really quite some time to arrive to the point that uh, uh, we, we are going to have these three layers of roof. The middle one will be a very rigid one, the structural one that uh, uh, actually we call it a kind of skeleton that it will be a tensile structure uh, uh, created by Peter from Tensis that uh, it will be the roof that retain all the rainwater because uh, for the M pavilion it has to be rainproof. It cannot be like the previous project that I have done that when it drains you just have to put on an umbrella. So uh, the, the, the middle structure will be uh, the, the rainproof uh, layer and also the main structure of the, the roof. And then we have the upper structure that give a kind of profile to the pavilion that is uh, trying to blend with the environment. And then we will have a ceiling the upper structure, the upper layer would be like a little bit like a hat that it could move a little bit. And then we have the ceiling that could move as much as you want. So, so like this, there are different degrees of rigidity and looseness in this uh, structure, in these uh, three layers. And uh, this is the section. You could see that uh, the three layers of uh, roof, upper, middle, and ceiling. And um, because we want uh, to have the structure that looks quite soft and loose, uh, basically ACOM, Ken and Nitro came up with this idea that uh, the, the main structure, this main skeleton in the middle, that it uh, uh, hold all these uh, ten tensions could be quite simple, but then the peripheral structure that is actually cre uh, holding less tension and now uh, basically would uh, hold the hanging structure could be uh, more into the soft curve. That's what we what we want. Uh, so this is this look very simple structure, but actually it is extremely complex. It is really uh, difficult to, to, to design and even to manufacture. Uh, we knew it well because we had to make a models. Like uh, first, uh, our structural engineer gave us this model, but we couldn't really understand it well. So we had to make a physical model to understand how, how the structure works, and then uh, to see how we're going to put the roof over. So it's really like handmade because uh, any um, computer software wouldn't help us to, to understand this. We just have to use like fabric to, to drape in into the structure to understand how, how the curve of all this would be. And then it's come to the materials. This is quite another issue of the material. We spent quite some time uh, trying to find proper material for the project. At the beginning, we were very, like, let's say, optimistic. We tried to find like, recycled, uh, homegrown, uh, that the material that would meet with uh, a lot of uh, um, building codes and all that. So it's not so easy. So we found out that uh, in terms of material for architecture, especially uh, with fabric, there's still a lot of rooms to, to work on. I mean, because there are not many, not many materials available. I'm glad that uh, this year, Living Cities Forum discussed the material flow, but because I think in architecture, this is still a big hole that we have to explore in terms of the material that would be more sustainable, more um, the performance that uh, could match uh, our uh, requirement of, uh, of the, the condition that could change and all that. So, so it's, uh, it's still really uh, a big area to explore. 
And uh, so finally, we actually, we were left with very few choices. Uh, so we, we, we used three different type of mesh uh, for the three layers. The, the upper layer that I said we wanted to have it like a bit of transparent to blend with the environment. We um, finally chose to work with a uh, fishing net. We just call a fishing net manufacturer in Bangkok. It happened to be Sam. And uh, we tried to talk to them on the phone and they did, we didn't understand each other at all. What, what are you talking about? Like to use it for a building and uh, like a pavilion? So, so we went there and we solved some of them. So we tried to talk to them like, okay, how much it's the, uh, the, the size of this net and everything. And then at the end they asked, just you, you asked very strange question, they said. So just tell us what kind of fish do you want to catch? <laughs> so we were like, okay. Um, we learned like a great deal about fish because uh, it, it turned out that uh, the colors of the nets, of the fishing nets, and the size of the, uh, the grid, it uh, depends on what kind of fish you, you want to catch and where you cache it, because different sea has different colors. Okay, this is like my blonde that uh, I didn't understand. Um, finally, uh, when we tried to tell them that we didn't really want to cache anything, we just want to wrap this pavilion, and uh, they said, okay, whatever you want to use. So we found the, um, the thickness and the um, size of the, the thread that we like, and then we asked them to make it uh, speci especially for us, instead of one color, it's like two colors together with uh, um, yellow and orange, like this. So I don't know how, if this uh, net could catch anything, but it looked nice at least. So now the net is produced and uh, being uh, cut and sawn in a factory, I, I think. And, um, and then the, um, the, the middle layer, which is the most functional, the most uh, important one also, it's uh, made out of this very new material called STFE. It is a kind of hybrid material, um, very technical, transparent hybrid uh, fluo, fluoral polymer with poly relate mesh. So it's a material that uh, a company, Search Ferrari, Kylie gave us a sponsorship to use this material. They intend to use it for, um, to replace glass for um, a lightweight uh, use, like at the end of the stadium like at the, the end of the stadium, that you don't want to use glass because it would be heavy, difficult to maintain. So this material would, could help to replace that. I think there are not so many buildings in the world yet, upon what Peter told us, uh, that uh, use this material. So the M Pavilion would be one of the few first buildings in the world using this material. So I'm glad that uh, Sir, uh, Sir, Sir, Sir Ferrari helped us on this. And then uh, we get into the, um, uh, the ceiling. The ceiling is, uh, is less uh, difficult, but still we have to deal with a lot of uh, issues as well. So finally, uh, we got the same uh, the material from Serge Ferrari as well. It's a kind of vinyl mesh that usually you use for bly and, uh, in, in, in buildings, but they could be used outdoor as well. So we will, uh, we will make them into uh, different uh, pattern of waffles uh, as a ceiling and uh, to, to cover the whole ceiling. And then uh, it could be a little bit moving when it catches the wind. So this is uh, the pattern of the waffle. This is one out of, I think, altogether we have 48 uh, totally different uh, uh, piece of waffle together 
working together. This is uh, like all the details that we we work on how to put them together, how to um, actually uh, tie them and uh, connect different pieces. And then this is the pattern that we gave to the manufacturer. Uh, manufacturers who, who made this. This time we are very happy that we didn't need to uh, cut and sew this ourselves. Usually we would do. <laughs> now we have like a professional doing this for us. That's good. And uh, this is the trial that we did uh, in Bangkok. They sent the sample, the material, but this one we made it ourselves to see how, uh, how it is in terms of um, behavior because it's difficult. The digital model wouldn't really allow to understand that much. Also in terms of how the material play with lights. So this is uh, the mock-up we did and uh, to, see, to see through how, it's how it would be. And, uh, and then this is just the first piece. We did really like the whole thing. Uh, every single piece we have to decide and make a model and adjust again. It's like, like this is like factory of models here and here. This is one to 10 scale model. And, uh, and then we, we work with like how to, how we uh, end the uh, details of the, the waffle here and there. Just everything is like one to one really because we never know how the material would behave until we really work it uh, with the actual scale, especially in this type of details, like a lot of mock-up, one-to-one, and uh, this is how the uh, fishing net would go with, with the waffle materials and so on. So that's the experiment on our side, and then we gave all the details to everyone here in Melbourne, and then the construction started. This is, I think, like last week, and uh, this is like this morning, and uh, the structures are, are up partly, and uh, by now it should be much more. And then this the photos that Peter Kylie sent out from the factory that they are they are making the waffle, and I hope they are doing very fine. So, <laughs> so um, actually. We really learned a great deal from working on the M Pavilion. It's brought us to really different levels of uh, understanding of uh, how we make a uh, shelter. Because uh, we would think that a shelter can be like just simple a roof, but then if you want a roof that has, have a, that has a lot of uh, quality requirement, it's require really a lot of technical supports from really engineers and uh, manufacturers and so on. So we, we think that uh, this is really a very big step forward for us to understand really this type of, uh, of I could say like this type of architecture. And as I said, uh, we really focus on how the pavilion would accommodate a lot of activity. This is the rendering that we kind of work with with uh, with um, the professional visualizer, like to to put really precise the, the um, all the activities to show that actually we want to have a lot of people coming here uh, using the space uh, and have the pavilion really as a background. Like I always keep telling people that at the end, people will not remember the pavilion. They will remember the, what happened at the pavilion, and they will remember there was some kind of nice or strange structure as a background, but they will remember that they come with their friends and on that day, and this is what happened. So if we could provide a nice background to them, that would be the best uh, architecture in, in my uh, ideas. Uh, so I really hope you come because uh, actually the programs are, are great. And not only that, not only that, we, we want you to come often. So we decided the pavilion 
will change every month. So the pavilion will change every month. So we will change the color of the kiosk every month. So from gray to this, uh, how do you call this? A little bit purple, and then coral color, and then magenta. So every month you can come and see the different uh, colors that support uh, us by Dulux, that the great support. So it's going to be fun. So please, uh, really, please come. I would be very happy. So this is about the pavilion. Now you are thinking that she's crazy completely <laughs> because she, she worked on these structures and uh, like the roof and all that. Uh, actually, we are very normal architect. We work on very <laughs> a lot of normal buildings as well, believe me. Like we work on houses, uh, showroom, uh, gallery, museum, uh, warehouse and uh, clinic and many things. Uh, it's just this type of architectures, this very thinnest, smallest, lightest form of architecture is our obsession. And we try to apply this really into the normal project we, we do as well. How we push the, the boundary even further into a normal um, commission that is, is not uh, uh, a temporary pavilion. And uh, that uh, helps us to learn actually a lot. Uh, so, I want to continue a little bit after the pavilion. When I gave a lecture uh, in Melbourne three years ago, mainly about these two projects, my uh, house, my office, and then this lighthouse and experiment uh, units, uh, living units uh, in Bangkok, Naomi told me, you have to scale up. You have to scale up. She, I think she told me like a few times. So, so I was like, okay, let's scale, scale up. <laughs> um, we had a chance to work on this project. It's, um, it's uh, lower, let's say, lower middle income housing project in the very suburb of Bangkok. It's uh, 400 units altogether. And it's uh, in the area, you, if you see the map here, it's the forecast how Bangkok is going to be flooded in 2050. So it's like basically all over. And uh, this project is somewhere here. So it's going to be completely flooded. Like, but it's the flood is not uh, uh, all the time. It will be kind of temporary, comes and go. So we got uh, to work on this project with uh, private developer. And we pushed the idea to them that uh, we should have like the ground floor completely open. So in case of floods, that uh, everyone will, will, be, will be okay. And then uh, we used the idea that we, we use with our building to, to have um, the concrete blocks, breeze block screen, front and back, so that uh, you have like complete ventilation, and uh, when the floods come, it's fine. So you, everyone would be, would would have to, to deal with the floods anyway. So we kind of copy ourselves in a smaller scale, and um, now the project is being built. Uh, the first uh, ten units, as a kind of uh, a mock-up unit not mock up, it's a kind of yeah, testing unit uh, just finished. So we are waiting for uh, the 390 units in the future. Just uh, everything is from our, the first project we, we did, our house here. So it's just the same principle, uh, but uh, in different form. And then during COVID, really desperate in, in, in Thailand, um, especially in this uh, types of living, in this informal living. Uh, I got a call from um, uh, a school of public health in Mahidon University. They found out that uh, in all the big hospital in Bangkok, COVID spread it 
very badly, not from the patient, but from the workers who work in the hospital, who live in this kind of environment. So they, they thought that it was uh, devastating. So they, they called me asking, can we do something about this? Of course not, we cannot do anything because uh, they live in a very dense condition. What I could suggest is just, ah, maybe we make like some more ventilation, some light, but it's very minor. It's really like impossible to do anything. So by the same time, we got an invitation to work on ex an exhibition in Madrid called Vulnerable Critters. It's about also like how human condition would uh, would get uh, really uh, deteriorated by all this uh, disease and pandemic and all that. So um, we proposed that we could, uh, we could have a kind of midterm solution instead of rebuilding this in a very uh, big uh, affordable housing would, would take like years, maybe 20 years. We could offer some kind of temporary solution for these uh, people building like four or five story building where they can actually have uh, better conditions in living. And uh, we propose that they can actually have a kind of uh, plug-in unit in case someone have to separate, have to uh, quarantine separately uh, at home. So this is uh, a system that, that we propose. and. Um, and then uh, it became a kind of an exhibition in Madrid uh, in May this year. So I became involved with this uh, uh, issues of uh, affordable housing. I got to uh, work with a few interesting group of people. So, the, um, so now I brought it uh, even further uh, at the design, advanced design studio that I am running at uh, Yale School of Architecture now. We work on the idea of uh, affordable housing, um, how we try to explore the possibility of affordable housing to the idea of informal living in a tropical climate. So uh, the final is coming soon. I hope we get nice thing out of that. Because of this also, I got also to work with some government agencies that uh, became interested in the issue quite strongly. So I hope that uh, we can really scale up the ideas that uh, I present uh, some time ago and in Melbourne. By now, if you are like students, you're thinking that uh, I, I got these questions a lot also, like uh, the world is kind of desperate. We have uh, this uh, housing problem, not only in Thailand, but I think it's everywhere. And we have like climate change problem that is became real, like flooding is really like, like so, uh, so real that, uh, that you cannot say that climate change is not true anymore. It's just so sudden and it's everywhere. Bangkok is really uh, my compared to many places like Pakistan, if you uh, follow the news. And then we have like mass migrations everywhere as well. Like the world is really like become very complex. And uh, we have uh, political situations everywhere. This is one of them in Thailand. And then as an architect, sometimes it feels like a little bit desperate. I got this question a lot from, uh, especially from, from students. And um, what architecture can do? But uh, I think it's not only with architects, but with everyone. But as an architect, uh, we just, have to, we just have to think how we use our skill and knowledge on basically build environment, labor division, we deal with labor a lot, uh, economics of building, special division that lead to social divisions, energy and natural resources consumption. How we deal with all this through, through our practice? Of course, the result is not uh, very immediate. It's, it's not like 
you do something and tomorrow things will change. But it will be a kind of collective uh, results from if uh, all of us start to, to think, start to, to discuss, start to explore. And uh, I am still certain that uh, we can make the world a little bit a better place in the very near future. And um, with um, some experiments and some attempts that we've done, I really hope we can apply really in a bigger scale. And uh, before I end my talk, which is uh, actually seven minutes beyond, um, I like to emphasize what I have shown you today are not my work alone. They are results of millions of collaborations, uh, especially those people who work closely with me at Ozone. They have spent numerous of hours, days and nights, uh, making all this happen. I also have to thank them. And finally, thank you very much for your time. It's really a pleasure to share everything with you today. Thank you so much. Look, Russia has gone slightly over, but we want to squeeze in some questions. So. There's a couple of roaming mics, I think, coming around. Yep. So, but one, look, I maybe just kick off first <laughs> until the audience gets okay, I, I stay here. heated up. And I think it's really important, Sam, this year we need fish and chips, I think, at the pavilion. Yeah, the appropriate food offering. Um, look, I think just it's interesting you turn to um, climate change more generally at the end of the presentation. and. Um, I mean, I think we get the perception that there is some significant shifts happening in Thailand and Bangkok and a new generation of designers have actually been really kind of empowered to take on climate change and some major infrastructure projects. I think it's the landscape practice uh, land process. Uh -huh. They're doing some I mean, huge work. Are you seeing a, a new generation coming through who, are kind of, who feel empowered to, to tackle this? Yeah, I, I think... I'm not saying like only designers, but I think younger generation, even younger than me, they are very conscious of this idea of uh, not only climate change in particular, but environmental issue, I would say. I'm, I'm always impressed by the fact that um, uh, younger people than I am, they carry a tumbler all the time. They don't buy, uh, water in a plastic bottle. I, I'm, I'm impressed because I, I wanted to do that, but I always forget. Like I, I leave my tumbler everywhere and I lost many of them. But then they're very, very serious in this. I, I think this is a very small gesture, but it shows that they really care. They don't want to use, they want, don't want to uh, be involved with single use plastic anymore. And that is impressive. I think it's uh, older generations, like including myself, we we are we are we've been a bit too comfortable in this. But uh, I think the younger generation they kind of see the very uh, near future that they have to deal with in a very uh, long term in their life, and that's why they have become more conscious and. Uh, I think that's why in, in, in also in, in practice, also in the issues we discuss in school, the students are more active on all this uh, environmental issue. The other thing I was curious about as well is just, I mean, there's a perception that places like Bangkok are starting to get more regulated. You know, you look at that informal settlement and you, you and I'm coming from a place like Australia, which is so regulated in many respects. How do you perceive that? To, you know, what's it going to look like in the next 10, 20 years as things start to get? I mean, it's living, for instance, you can live, uh, you can have retail, you can have commercial, all in the same layered environment. So it sounds to me that there's going to be a big shift happening as well in terms of how planning works and zoning. It's a very, it's getting quite gentrified. Uh, lots of uh, informal settlements are being kind of cleaned up. Uh, 
But then uh, uh, the, um, I think people also start to be aware that uh, you cannot uh, wipe out all this uh, from the city because it is uh, all these elements that make the city alive. You have to try to find a way to have also this kind of less formal, I'm not saying like completely informal, less formal uh, uh, elements of the city remain. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, you get uh, something that is extremely gentrified and dry. And uh, well, we have to be aware that uh, Bangkok is also a place that lives on tourism. Yeah. And that, uh, that kind of uh, less formal or informal elements of the city is the one that actually attract people to come. So, but uh, the, uh, the, again, the degree is uh, how much we do, how much we regulate, how much we let it uh, grow it, a little bit naturally. Is that a discussion that's happening with the design community and with the... Uh, not much yet, but I think people start to be aware. And, uh, and, and in, in terms of city planning, I think they, they start to talk about it, but in a lower scale, like a smaller scale at architecture, not much yet. But of course, in, in terms of planning, a lot of discussion is going on about this, how we keep uh, the city alive, allowing some degrees of interventions, informal interventions. All right, have we got any questions from the audience? One. I was intrigued. As a microphone, you can. Hello. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, I was in, thanks for the um, wonderful presentation. Um, I'm excited and can't wait to see the an experience in pavilion um, in person. Um, with that in pavilion, I found a very interesting juxtaposition between the fish net which is done by uh, a local who's skilled in that. However, you know, he's just a local group of people who do the fishnet for their entire life. You know, nothing, did, did, like, I, I said, perhaps didn't go to the school, right? That's just what they learned from their um, generations and grandparents and stuff. And you put that next to the high performance fabric that would require lots of certificating computer generating and technologies and mm -hmm. things. What like how do you feel when when when, when you find out you have to put two things next to each other and actually they complement one another? Actually the fishing is, is not uh handmade at all. It's actually, they have a big factory. They export all over the world, but they never done it with, uh, with a building. And they, are very, they were very happy, they were very keen that we're going to use it with a building because this would actually expand their business. They have like gigantic factory, really like it's, they, uh, if it is handmade as you say, uh, it cannot uh, sustain uh, these types of uh, performance because it has to be checked, it has to be uh, uh, kind of standards. So in a way it is not that uh, different, it's just that uh, it's more like a different technology. The fishing net is less um, complex, less complicated technology than the, the other materials, but still it's, uh, it's a big factory is a big manufacturer. Uh, the fishing nets that you are talking about, uh, I think they cannot make like bigger than this table. And it will take forever. <laughs> it will take like two months to make it as big as this table. Thank you. You're welcome. Can we squeeze in one, one more question? There's one in the front. So we've got a few. Um, hi, Richard Thank you for the presentation. Really engaging. 
Um, I'm curious because you did mention a bit about, you know, you've dealt with, you are obsessed with temporary in installations and pavilions, but you've also done, you've had also had experience in building, you know, more permanent structures. Mm -hmm. So for me, I'm curious whether do you see a different design approach when you're building a temporary structure compared to something that's more permanent, um, like the... Like Bubble house. Yeah, example. yes. Uh, I would say that the process wouldn't be different because, uh, because it's the same. You have to think of how people use it, the comfort level, the safety and all that. But uh, um, the temporary structures allow you to experiment more. That's, that's the thing. And then uh, usually we try to push the boundary. It, 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 could it be less? Could it be less? Could it be less material? Could it be less of everything? Could it be a new way to look at the materials? With the temporary structures, if it doesn't work, uh, it will be short. Like, let's say the, the failure will be short. <laughs> but then, if it's more permanent structure, you have to be more careful. But uh, again, I would try to use, uh, to apply the knowledge that I work on temporary structure on also permanent building. Uh, that, uh, again, can we reduce it? Do we need this uh, element? Uh, if we put one layer instead of two, what's happened? Can we kind of combine all the layers together? Or if we combine all the layers together, it became very expensive. Or can we, so instead of one layer, can we make trees so that it's cheaper, lighter even? So I think it's the same process and the same approach, but uh, the constraints are different. All right, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. In the front side, just in the front Hello. Um, I was just wondering, you've spoken about uh, a lot about temporary structures. Um, I was wondering whether you could speak to life cycle design, perhaps, and what happens to these structures and materials, uh, temporary or permanent, and how much of your practice uh, and design process is uh, concerned or thinking about that? Um, actually, most of the uh, temporary structure I show you, they keep reuse it. They keep reusing it. Like the mumless guy, they, I think they set up already for five times. Like, uh, I think they overuse it already. <laughs> they should stop using it. And, uh, and uh, the butterfly effect as well, they use it in different places. Uh, the, the idea that if you use it once and throw it away, uh, it's very, it would be very uncomfortable to me to work on. So usually I would like to make sure that they can keep reusing this. And uh, I'm, I'm thinking what I've shown. Most of them are kind of reused uh, in some form, some places. So in the case of M Pavilion, I hope that it will be relocated and reused somewhere. <laughs> Uh, thank you. So, like, uh, this is Eva. I'm currently an uh, MIT student. So, thank you for the very fabulous lecture. So, within the lecture, there is a one common thing across all your projects. As I remember, like, you mentioned that due to the limitation of barges, the design adjustment progress will be very complicated and enjoyable. So, requiring more repeat process uh, till the final construction. But uh, when it moved to the M Pavilion, you can cooperate with more professional engineers and get a strong support from a like more professional team. So um, I'm just curious within this. So if the design ha has become more precise or like has more possibilities, could uh, inspire you to move like more design? Of course, of course, <laughs> it's. Uh we, usually, we would uh, experiment ourselves and uh, observe uh, how structure and or fabric behave. But now we have like great engineers working with us, so we can ask and they help us uh, a lot uh, to visualize to tell us this is 
this would work, this wouldn't work. And uh, I think this is really a step, big step forward. And uh, the collaborations really help to formulate what we what we are today. With, without them, um, I wouldn't be able to to formulate such a thing. It's just like right. I have the ideas in mind, but it's very vague in terms of form. I have the ideas of the quality of the pavilion that I would like to to achieve, but then I didn't really have a very clear idea of the forms. Yeah. So with the great support of uh, these professional engineers, uh, I listen to them a lot, and to actually, and uh, and and they really support uh, to formulate the the idea into the finals. Thank you. Thank you very much. One last bit, Ben. Do you want to? Oh, sorry, to leave as well. Ben, are you? Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. It was beautiful. Thank you. Um, you mentioned a couple of times in the presentation that the the digital tools wouldn't allow you to recreate some of the effects that Maybe you were I'm interested in. <laughs> no, but I, I think that's that's really interesting is the relationship of the physical making and the digital, particularly in the Empavian, where you see an intersection of the expertise that um, Aircom's bringing. As a design educator, how do you see the relationship between the digital tools and the physical making for students who are coming into the profession now? I think it's uh, very uh, important that uh, they, are, they are literate in digital tools. They need to, need to be able to handle digital tools. But then, uh, actually, digital tools, to me, they're very deceptive. They, give the idea, they usually give the idea that it is complete, it is finished. But actually, there are lots of dimensions that you couldn't really understand from the digital tools. For example, fabric is impossible to render. Fabric is impossible to actually uh, to generate in Rhino. Maybe I'm not good enough, like my team are not good enough. I don't know. But then we were not able to generate exactly what we wanted in Rhino. It always came out like a bit funny. So we had to uh, make the 1 to 10 scale model to understand how, how the fabric would, would behave all the time. So um, I think it is uh, crucial that you know digital tools, but you have to know also that it's not everything. You have to work back and forth. I think the most uh, um, effective uh, approach that we use is like digital tools and then physical models and go back and forth, back and forth all the time. It's the only way that we could comprehend exactly how uh, all these uh, elements would behave. And one last one, Helene. Thanks for a really inspiring lecture with also so much great pedagogical content and um, the material experimentation and the work on the models as test sites for, you know, thinking through the problems that you're addressing. It's, it's really great. I've got a very specific question that I realised was beginning to bother me as I was listening to the fantastic story of the fishnet and, the, you know, this beautiful way of bringing the two colours together to create the fishnet and everything. And then I was thinking of the site of the M Pavilion in Queen Victoria Gardens and the botanical gardens nearby. And then I was beginning to think about all the wildlife in the area, the birds and the possums and the bats. And I was wondering about the netting on the roof and whether there might be any impact in terms of um, accidentally capturing and injuring wildlife because of the role of the netting, which I know can be an issue, for instance, um, you know, in gardening, we use a lot of netting over trees uh -huh. to keep the fruit safe. And um, if you use the wrong kind of netting, then you get birds stuck in it and so forth. Uh -huh. And yes, I was wondering whether there'd been kind of thought of those kinds of wildlife ecologies in the park as part of the process. We thought of, I think we had this discussion, but then since, uh, since we didn't have enough knowledge actually to, to, uh, to get into that, um, Basically, uh, we did we used uh, these different types of nets in a lots of projects, and uh, these questions always 
comes up once in a while. Um, but so far, we never had any experience that birds or little animals uh, would get into this uh, piece of building. Because I think because if, if you have like activities around, they don't come. This is what I thought. <laughs> because in, in the project, we uh, the, the small uh, retail project that I show, actually the ceiling, it's also with a small, very light net. And uh, at the beginning, the client was very worried, ah, the bird's going to come, but nothing happened. Nothing, no animal would ever come because I think it's, uh, it's too, too noisy, too bright, too maybe. Let's see if it's happened, we, we try to fix. <laughs> well, thank you. And I think we'll wrap things up. Now, before you start clapping, uh, Please. I think there's no question that M Pavilion is now a major seasonal event um, in the Melbourne calendar. And I think it's an important statement about the d design intent of the city. And I think it's important to say on behalf of the design community, just again, like, to congratulate the foundation for another brave commission. And uh, please, everyone, join me in congratulating the Foundation and um, Rashapur. Thank you. Thank you.